So. The Battle of Jutland. Well. This is not about the battle. Although, to an extent, I suppose it is. It's about the fleets which fought at Jutland. It's about how they came to be. And... Well, I can tell you what it's not going to be. Someone's already asking the question. Am I going to go into the GDP and all the different details? Well, as you know, I've got, not far away from me, the British Historical Statistics book. Which has all the GDP and details for the UK. It does. The equivalent works I can find, and this might be limited, this is limited to the works I can find, for the German economy, are very, very exhaustive, but not in one volume. And honestly, to figure them out, I have a very nice friend who's an economic historian. Who would have to spend, and is, has kindly volunteered if I procure the books, to spend a few weeks of her time trying to figure it out for me so I can put it in equivalential figures. So, GDP stuff, maybe it'll be part of the Christmas. I'll be doing GDP comparisons of the major naval build up. How's that sound? I'll see if I can't get it through. But that's going to probably require even more books because it means I'm going to have to track down the equivalent. Historical historical um, statistics books for Japan and for the United States and for France. Maybe even for Chile, Argentina and Brazil. Sorry, I'm just mentally doing the maths on that one. Can, you're, you're, you're probably sitting there thinking, well, Alex, that's just seven books. I've worked out that's probably going to be roughly seven to eight hundred pounds. Which is doable. But that's going to be a few months' work. So, if this video is not about the GDP, and I'm telling you this up front, just in case you're turning up and wanting to hear about the GDP, what is it about? Well, it's about the realities of building fleets. It's about the fact that they don't just magically appear. That you're looking at the products of not just years of work, not just decades of work, but multiple decades of work to put that fleet together. Please note this is on building the fleets, not training the fleets. I've got a plan for a year called Gear of Personnel. This is the Year of Technology, Year of Personnel. Uh, it's going to come up at some point, and that's going to be all about the training of the fleets and the key people. You know, instead of a key ship series, you'll have a key people series. But all these things worked out. Good few years of videos planned. If we can keep the caffeine and trigger levels going in my body, then it should work. So, this is all about the construction side. This is about the tech side. This is about the evolution of these navies. But it's also about the stats. And the first thing you find when you start looking at the fleets at Jutland is you realise just how much the German Navy had to sacrifice to get to the position where it was and how much that sacrifice undermined it in actually pushing that position forward. Because when you look at the ships you start to realise there is a huge imbalance going on here. And it's not necessarily in the area where you thought it would be. Or where it should be. As always, my shameless book plug. Thank you for your support. The people who've bought the books, the people who, you know, that this is... 
The checks from this are how I afford to do so many things. The checks from Patreon, where you suggest all those wonderful topics. It's how this channel manages to buy the books it needs to work. The support on here. That's what pays for things like the equipment. And when I say equipment, I mean cameras and those sort of things, sort of fuel when I'm driving off to a place to do the videoing. Hiring a car at the moment, if I have to hire a car. Still need to find a decent car to buy. I've had some good offers come through from nice people on here with suggestions, and I have looked at them. The trouble is, sometimes I look at them and I go, that's a lovely car, it makes perfect sense. But I've seen the roads I drive down sometimes to go visit family in Cornwall and Scotland. Basically, think Subaru 4x4. Volvo, designed to basically be bashed up and still keep working. Or SUV. And I'm not talking Chelsea tractor style with no clearance. I'm talking something with actual decent clearance because there will be rocks on the road which will be the size of my head. So either the car needs to be able to go over them without noticing them or it needs to go over them, if that makes sense. All those things, matter. Those things are made possible by your support. And of course Australia. We're still amazed by that. We are. There was a sort of bet amongst us in that, especially after being turned down for funding and trying to get support from various the organisations which are supposed to support historical research. And it's a case of, okay, so you're not going to support it. We'll see if we can self-fund it, and we'll see if we can, if. The lovely, if our lovely subscribers, if our followers, or the people who watch the channels are going to support us. And you did it. You did it. You're the reason we're this close to getting Gareth. This close. Honestly, I think he might cheat at this point, but I'd prefer him not to because I know he's had a very, very expensive year and I prefer him to be you know if he if, if he was cheating to come he would be probably knowing him book himself into the most minimal hotel possible and be storing his valuables in our hotel rooms and those sort of things <laughs> I love him dearly but yeah I can see him doing that so thank you it wouldn't be possible without you So here are what we have at Jutland. Roughly 250 ships. 44 Dreadnought battleships. 14 battle cruisers. Such battle cruisers. And please note, if you look up the battle cruiser fleet, it's two words, battle cruiser. If you look up many of the designations of battle cruisers in this period, it's two words, battle cruiser. The single word status comes about far later in World War One, really on it honestly, to an extent in the interwar years. And as I've often used it to describe myself when I'm talking about the spectrum, the capital ship spectrum of this period, we have the full dreadnought battleships armoured armoured and firepower and speed is well it's something nice to have you want to be a decent speed but it's not the be all and all then you have fast battleships where they're getting faster and speed's getting more important battle cruisers single word speed is much more important than it was even with fast battleships but they are designed for long range cruising but they're designed to go and kill battle cruisers two words where speed is the uh, and, and cruising is the be all and end all or have roughly just the same spectrum of armaments. Well, this period, battle cruisers are it.
And yes, I've even deigned because I know it's more acceptable to use the phrase pre-dreadnoughts. I don't. I usually use the phrase sovereign uh, sovereign starships, and there is next week going to be coming out a video about sovereign star battleships. And why I call them sovereign star battleships. And I divide the battleships up so because I don't consider pre dreadnought to be a good terminology. But pre dreadnought tends to come about in World War I to describe the ships which are sort of the old style at this point. And yes, the Germans took some along. But you'll see why the Germans did take them along when you see some of the stats that are involved. The Germans are doing their level best to cheat. And they're doing the best to cheat because they have to. And Lord help them if the Royal Navy's pre dreadnoughts have been there as well in force. Because yes, the German dreadnoughts could have smashed the Royal Navy's pre dreadnoughts to pieces. But doing so while they were doing that, the Royal Navy's dreadnoughts could have overwhelmed them. If someone in the Royal Navy had been prepared to sacrifice that many ships and men to it, they could have set up a manoeuvre which would have wiped out the German Navy in a day. It would have just cost them hmm, 30 pre-dreadnought battleships. Thankfully, no one was that cruel and no one was that callous. Armoured cruisers, they're the British equivalent of. They're brought along, but no one's quite sure why sometimes. But you start to realise very quickly the reason the British bring them along is because they are making the most of their cruiser advantage. Because whilst there are 37 light cruisers there, they are not evenly divided in any way, shape or form. Then we have the torpedo boats versus torpedo boat destroyers, and frankly I would say that it's an interesting debate as to which constitutes which. And then we have mine layer, a mine layer, and a seaplane carrier. I don't count the German submarines which are around. They don't really get involved in the battle, and they can't really maneuver to be part of the battle. They just happen to be there, in the same area. So, here it is. Here are new ships. Please note, I've grouped them by year of launch. So, Queen Elizabeth class. The Queen Elizabeth class. HMS Merlea, 1915 launch. She's at the Battle of Jutland. HMS Revenge. She's at the Battle of Jutland. She's a Revenge class. The Royal Navy also has HMS Royal Sovereign, HMS Resolution, and HMS Ramillies there. Think about that. The Royal Navy has so many 15-inch ships that they actually choose to leave some behind. Yes. Queen Elizabeth herself just returned from the Dardanelles campaign as I was in refit. Not available for Jutland. And HMS Emperor of India, Miss Jutland for routine servicing. Audacious had, of course, been lost earlier in the war. But the point I'm making to you is this. The German Navy launches Bayern and Baden as their two 15-inch battleships. The Royal Navy leaves Royal Sovereign, Resolution and Queen Elizabeth. Three 15-inch capital ships that they continue with standard maintenance and in Royal Sovereign's case, because of crew inexperience. And Resolution is sort of still fitting out. But instead of rushing any of their ships, they go, right then, we've got three 15-inch ships. <laughs> yeah, we'll leave them at home. We will leave them behind. Renan and Repulse are similar. The Royal Navy isn't pushing itself to get its 15-inch ships into the front line. It's left more 15-inch ships back at home than the German Navy has in total. Think about that.
Then we get on to the 1914 launch ships, and of course, Queen Elizabeth comes up there, and, you know, the revenges again. But we have a Queenie class. We have a Kron Prince. Kron Prince had actually been fairly slow to build, kind of like a lot of the German ships. She is laid down in 1912. Her contemporaries are laid down in 1911, while the rest of her class, i.e. Koine, Krosser, Kreuzfurst, and Magraf. But the interesting thing is their contemporary in laying down are the King George V's. Atrimus, King George V, Centurion, Ajax, and Audacious. Audacious, of course, had been lost in 1914. And the only one that's on this list from the King George V class is Ajax. That's the only one that's included, and it's launched in 1912. Audacious had been as well. But she's gone. Whereas the contemporaries, their contemporaries, in terms of being launched, that's not even being commissioned. If we consider Ajax, who's here, lay down February 1911, launched March 1912, completed March 1913. The Koenig, laid down in 1911. Commissioned August 1913. The Crown's Prince had been laid down in 1912. She's commissioned in November 1914. But it's the McGrath and the Grosser at Kurtfurst, which are really kind of interesting because they are laid, both laid down in 1911 as well, along with the Koenig. And they're commissioned in July 1914 and October 1914. So, either the Crown Prince managed to catch the Matt Graf up, or the Matt Graf goes really, really, really slowly on the route to commissioning. And this is the other point you have to start looking at it. The Royal Navy has a lot of fairly new ships. If we consider them, this is a battle taking place in 1916. The Royal Navy has two ships which are in the battle, which are about a year old in ship age terms. We usually age a ship from when in the year it's launched. Not the year it's laid down, or the year it's commissioned, the year it's launched. It has... Three ships which are a couple of years old. It has five ships which are three years old. And three which are four years old. On this list, we have two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, thirteen ships which serve a Jutland. And, well, for the Royal Navy versus five for the German Navy. The point that's often been made and discussed is about the naval, the naval arms race and when it's over. Well, yes, some of these ships, Argincourt, Canada... Erin. Those ships were not being built for the Royal Navy. Those ships were being built for foreign navies in British yards and were taken up by the Royal Navy. But still, even if you take those three out, it doesn't really improve for the German Navy in terms of production coming in in this period. Now, the Koenig Albert, that is, of course, another of the vessels. That is the one of the Kaiser class. And it should be there in 1912, launched, with the Prince Regent Lisbold. But her main condensers on all, well, all three main condensers. All their tubing had broken and cracked and needed to be repaired. Now, 
And that's a big blow when you think about it because that is 10, 12 inch guns. That is a Kaiser class. Yeah. She has three steam turbines. Yes, she has a top speed of 22.1 knots, but she's one of the vessels they had laid down in 1910. She's important, because one of the things you have to consider with designing of dreadnoughts and designing the ships, you get more experience every class you design. They should be better. They should be better armoured, more efficiently armoured, more efficiently protected, more efficiently structured, as you go on, as you build more. So it really matters how many of your sh newest ships are available. Because they will often be your best designs. Now I know, we can critique the R-Class all we like. And that's usually they suffer because... It, by World War II, they don't have the space of the Queen Elizabeth to be upgraded. They don't have the speed the Queen Elizabeth can have. And therefore they don't have the utility the uti Queen Elizabeth can have in the independent task force operations. Which are the feature of World War II's naval warfare. But in World War One, they are fine ships. In World War One, you'd be quite happy to be in an R class. That's a fine fighting ship. He'd be happy to be in an Iron Duke. They're also fine fighting ships. And that's the advantage the Royal Navy has. It has a lot of ships. So much so, that I will emphasize, there are more 15-inch battleships for the Royal Navy sitting out this battle because of maintenance and because, in the case of the Royal Sovereign, because of judged inexperience than the German Navy builds. The point is for the Bayern and the Baden, they commissioned in July and October 1916. They were laid down in 1913. If they were on here, they would be put in the launched in 1915 category. So if either Bayern or Baden had got to the battle, they would have been up here. In this spot. Next to Queen Elizabeth. H uh, Queen Elizabeth class is HMS Malaya. And the Revenge class is HMS Revenge. But they're not. They're not. So, they're not there. When the German Navy really needs its most powerful hitting weapons, it doesn't have them. And the German Navy has really lesser reason than the Royal Navy for their ships to be in long-term maintenance and issues are not ready. Because they're deciding the timeline for this. Remember, it's their operation. They're coming out. They're dictating to the Royal Navy when this battle is going to be. They should be able to do the preparations, etc., to ensure they have the required force they need at the battle. Because it's their plan. The Royal Navy is trying to maintain the maximum availability of forces in order to be able to meet them with overwhelming numbers. But the Royal Navy isn't going into the North Sea waiting and to bait them into coming out and fighting them. They have to wait for the German Navy to come out to fight them. And so, any ships which aren't there are the German navies. Are on German Navy decisions. They're on the decisions of the Kaiserlich Marine. Now we go back into the early ones. And these times things start to map out. And you notice there are some... Spots of black starting to appear 
over on this side. Which is why I've used black as this sort of symbology, because it helps me illustrate where the gaps are. You have the King George V class, Orion class, Colossus class, those are the Helglands. All these ships being made at the same time as each other, being built at the same time. Sometimes you have multiple generations under construction and being launched out of sequence. Orion is the first 13 and a half inch capital ship for the Royal Navy. She's the first one with 13 and a half inch guns. And she is almost directly a response to the fact that the German Navy have upgraded to 12 inch guns. The US Navy is of course chucking out 12 inch guns and talking about upgrading to 14 inch guns. And the Italian Navy is talking about is doing 12 inch guns and not talking about upgrading and so is the Japanese and the British are going right then we have to jump up first because now the Germans have parity. And they're 12 inch guns. And the thing is if the anyone else jumps up first, then the Germans will follow them, and we might lose that advantage. Because this is a tech race. But the Germans sit in 12 inch for a long time, and don't really jump up again until the Royal Navy jumps up to 15 inch. Why? I talked about this before in another video, and someone accused me in the comments of what I said would be, could be interpreted as saying the Germans were dumb. And that wasn't what I meant at all. And I listened back and I don't think I did say that, but I can understand where they might... where they might have been able to infer that as being an unspoken comment. I think that would be a fair, in, a, fair, a fair assessment to make. I'm not the type who makes unspoken comments. So let me explain this one in full. The German Navy have a constant problem in their life. Uh, whether they're the Kaiserlich Marine, the Reichsmarine, or the Kriegsmarine, whatever they are, they have a constant problem in their life. It's called the German Army. When it comes to politics, economics, industry, any scenario, they always finish fourth. Okay? Fourth. German army comes in first in defense spending. Uh, then you have whatever the German army's pet nutty project is of that particular year. That finishes second. Eventually you'll have an air force, but before that you have the various interesting formations of not quite troops and not quite army, but not quite not army personnel that the German forces attract at various points in their life periods. And then you have the German Navy. And basically, whilst it can get perhaps a lot more money than than two of those other organisations, it will only get that money as long as they have first got what they need. And it will only get any money as long as the, number, the army in number one has got what it needs. And when you couple that with a maritime industry which is not as developed or deep, so getting things done is more expensive, 
there isn't as breadth of a competition within the companies. And to be honest, the companies don't compete in the same way for international orders that other nations do. They do compete for international orders. Please not say, and I'm not saying they are not competing. Krupp, guns, and all sorts of things go all over the places. But what I'm talking about is that the British maritime industry will often compete for whole ship delivery projects. Guns, everything. The whole ship. And will often present a tender which is the whole ship, not components thereof. The Germans start to develop into that, but there is a reason why the British are selling battleships to the rest of the world. The Americans are selling battleships to the rest of the world, or trying to, and the Germans are just sort of, in terms of dreadnought battleships, almost as World War I starts, to get, uh, starts off. And that's why the Greek battleship, which I covered in the Dreadnought series, didn't get delivered. But the thing is, famously, her guns weren't German. They weren't going to be German. The Greeks hadn't chosen the German guns. Why? Because, honestly, according to the Greek report sources on this, not the German sources on this, they didn't feel there was a joined-up joined pitch going on between them, and they weren't sure, actually, whether the guns were right for the ship. Now... When you look at all this construction going on, when you look at the Nassau class, the Nassau class were the German Navy's first dreadnought ships. And they're all triple expansion engines. They're all armed with 12 11 inch guns and have a broadside of 8 11 inch guns. They're laid down in 1907. They are launched mostly in 1908 and commissioned in 1909 and 1910. Where is the problem for the German Navy? Is it the yards that can construct the hulls? Or is it the fitting out yards? Are they have a shortage in? Or is it that Tirpitz, for all his many, many faults, and the man really had a lot of faults, has spent half his life penny pinching? So he didn't go over budget and didn't upset the Reichstag or the army in terms of being profligate. And didn't have the volume of construction going through to keep all the necessary yards functioning at a peak of efficiency. So had to sometimes artificially extend out the construction of ships to reduce their costs and to make yards look busier. Especially the German naval yards. Another dreadnought not at the Battle of Jutland. HMS Dreadnought was refitting in preparation for joining the Channel Fleet as flagship. So, the Royal Navy had, from all their construction, had one ship which had sunk, audacious, HMS Dreadnought, which was off in refit. Queen Elizabeth in refit. 
and Pravindya in refit. Raw Sovereign left behind due to current experience. Resolution fitting out. Ramleys launched 12th of June 1916. They also have Renown and Repulse wandering around. The point I'm making is for the Germans to make a worthwhile dent in the Royal Navy fleet. And by this mean, I mean a worthwhile f dent which brings them to somewhere approaching parity. And they have 21 dreadnoughts there versus 37. That's including battle cruisers. If we add in Renown and Repulse, which takes you up to nine, then to prevent the Royal Navy returning to parity, the Germans would have to, for 21 dreadnoughts, would have to sink. And this is the really, really difficult part to imagine them doing. Not 16 ships, but 25 ships. From zero losses. The German Navy, in order to achieve a level of parity in ship numbers, with the Royal Navy, who is turning up with 37 ships, to face the Germans 21 ships in terms of dreadnought terms. And that's battleships and battle cruisers. German Navy, and there's nine more for the Royal Navy, not including Courageous, Glorious, Furious, those ones. Just talking about Renown, Repulse, and the ships I mentioned here. Would have to sink. Not just the difference between their 21 and 37, which is 16 ships. They would then have to sink a further 9 ships. So they had to sink 25 ships out of 37. For the loss of 0 ships. That is a staggering win to loss ratio. Is what they were needed needed to achieve. And yes, we can make some of the cases about their various qualities and qualifications of their ships and how good and skilled their ships were. And I've seen various claims made about Lutzau going around and where people go, well, this shows the quality of her construction. The fact that she managed to make it a port. I would say there's an equal quality of construction going around. I'd say that's the quality of her crew and how hard they worked. But if you want to give that credit of the ship getting back to port like that to its technology and construction, I can't really stop you. But there's also the fact that to inflict more losses than they managed to achieve on the Royal Navy, especially the level which they would need to have, needed to have achieved, they would have started racking up losses themselves. And that's when you get into real trouble, because, yes, the Germans have got a couple of ships coming up. The Bad and the Bairn. But they haven't got much behind that. And this is a Nassau class. This is a Royal Navy identification drawing. And this is what the ship actually looked like. Identification drawing isn't bad, is it? And the thing is, the Nassau class formed the basis of a lot of German design for a long time. 
with their dreadnoughts. If you go and look at various vessels, including, well, including the Kaiser class to an extent, you will find their similarities in them. You will find those classes are sharing design ideologies. What do I mean by ide ideal design ideologies? Well, it's quite simple. If you look through some navies, some form, some shaping, some pattern of layout and displacement becomes sacrosanct. It would be if the Royal Navy had asked after Nelson and Rodney had from that point on built its cruisers with an all forward armament, all forward main armament, built all its battleships with an all forward main armament, maybe even looked at possibly putting all forward main armament in destroyers, you would say that was a design ideology. With the Germans, believe it or not, it's the shaping of the bridge structure. It's the, to an extent, the six-sided star approach to their gun layout. And I'd say it's also to the mounting of certain casemates and where they position them, because even though they have trouble with them it getting flooded with water, they still put them there again and again and again. Because that's where they put them. So also long for the ride. pre -dreadnoughts. There are no British pre there. Why did the Germans bring pre Not only that, why did they bring not just one, not just two, three, four, five, but six pre -dreadnoughts? pre dreadnoughts which for all their wonderful, wonderful um, attributes are not exactly fast. The Brantwick class, hmm, they 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 good ships. They are they they're good ships. And the Hessen, well, she's not the youngest, not the oldest. She'd been commissioned in September 1905, and she had a top speed of 18.2 knots. The Deutschland class, well, the fastest amongst them, the Schleswig Holstein, could do 19 knots. But the Hanover and the Schleisten, they could do 18 and a half knots. If they're lucky. On a good day. So you've got a load of ships which are cruising to fight and you have brought along ships which can only do 18 and a half knots. Not too much to worry about because well your Nassau class they can do 20 knots. The German Navy is trying. They are trying really, really hard to bring the maximum capability to the battle they can. And again, they are choosing when the fight takes place. They are choosing which of their pre dreadnoughts to take. So the Royal, the Royal Navy choosing to hamper them by taking pre dreadnoughts. It's the German Navy thinking about those stats which I earlier talked about, about how many Royal Navy ships they need to take out for no losses, and thinking, well, actually, bringing six pre-dreadnoughts might not be a bad thing, because that's going to up our ship numbers just a bit. And it will do. It will up your ship numbers just a bit. And then we have the battle cruisers. And battle cruisers. I would say Queen Mary, Tiger, for the Royal Navy, to an extent the Lions are in the battle cruiser single word category. I'd say Invincibles and Indefatigals. Well, they're not. 
Now, the Hindenburg had been launched in August 1915. So had the two renowns been launched at this point. In January and March 1916, respectively. They would be commissioned in September and August 1916. Hindenburg would be commissioned in May 1917. Pace of the fitting out yard. Small issue. HMS AS Australia was undergoing repairs following commission, uh, a collision with HMS New Zealand, which resulted in Australia being damaged and a sister going, You hit me! And Australia going, what, what, The sisters, how is it you barely scrape a scratch and there's me needing repairs? New Zealand going, Well, I'm HMS New Zealand. Didn't you notice? I'm blessed. Again, we look through this, and there is a small problem going on here for the Germans. Yes. Their ships are much better armed. There is an interesting discussion about whether or not the German battle cruisers are actually fast battleships, because... They ha Germany has a similar thinking and thought process as Japan does, which led to its 8-8 scenario prior, and, well, 4-4 scenario, and then later on 8-8 scenario, uh, prior to the Battle of Tsushima and all the, and the Russo Japanese War, etc. In that, to them, because they are so short of battleships, and they can never produce enough battleships to take on the Royal Navy, the battle cruisers have to be built to be able to also be function as part of the battle line. Which the Royal Navy doesn't build its battle cruisers to do. Especially not its early battle cruisers. They're not built to be part of the battle line. It should never have been there. That's not their purpose. But still. These are battle cruisers, and these are battle cruisers. They are built heavier. And this does explain their survival in many, many regards. But it also is a Goban. We talk about the Goban and its effect on the Royal Navy. We talk about the fact it survives against the Darnells. Yes, that's great. But look at that from a loss perspective of the German Navy. The differentials in numbers of battle cruisers they have available. And you realise very quickly, Goban is a sixth of their battlecruiser strength. It would add 20% more vessels available for their operations. 20%. Increase their vessel operation by 20%. That's a big capability increase. And if we consider the damage they inflicted on BT's force in the first place... An extra vessel could have been really helpful. But there is a small problem for the, uh, the scenario. Because if we go through Tiger, Queen Mary, New Zealand, Princess Royal, Royal Lion, Indefatigable, Invincible, Inflexible and Indomitable. We end up with nine ships. Nine British battle cruisers. The differential between the Royal Navy and the German Navy in terms of dreadnought vessels at Jutland, is 16. The referential number I've told you, as I told you earlier, that you need to sink to equate quality, is... Well... 25. So... Even if the Germans had sunk the entire, had sunk, the entire battle cruiser fleet. All nine of the battle cruisers. The Royal Navy would not have been weaker than the German Navy. 
Now, you can come back to me and go, well, Alex, what happens if they manage to sink 5th Battle Squadron? That is quite a scary thought, because that would mean four 15-inch ships lost. Out of the six they had with them that day, and out of the... Let's go back and check the figures exactly. The... Four out of six they had of them, they have another... Three there, another one there. So, uh, four out of the ten the Royal Navy have. If the Germans manage to sink all four of them. And if they sink all four of those and all nine battle cruisers, they have sunk 13 ships, and that is a tremendous and terrible loss in life, and something the Royal Navy would prefer very much not to happen. And would undoubtedly have led to massive inquiries in Parliament and a massive reconstruction program of British battleships and British capital ships, which would have been carried on after World War One was over in order to prov uh, provide the Royal Navy with a Navy second to none, because, you know, it's the British Empire that depends on its naval security. And obviously they've been found wanting. Uh, you couldn't hear the lot of the arguments going on for such devastating loss. But they'd have still had a fleet which was stronger, materially and numerically, by a long margin, than the German Navy. And also, you can sit there and think, well, hang on, what are the chances that the Ger German Navy managed to sink all 13 of those ships without losing some of their own? Lutzau, perhaps. Von der Tann. Moltke. Seidlitz. Seidlitz was in a lot of trouble. And then they're equally as damaged. And they can't repair those numbers as quickly or as easily, relatively speaking, as the British can. If you want anything that shows the difference between British shipbuilding and German shipbuilding, I usually use Tiger and De Flinger as the examples. Both are beautiful in their own ways. One is possibly one of the most beautiful, objectively beautiful ships the Royal Navy has ever had in service, and one of the most beautiful ones that has ever been built in any time period in the world. With those lines, the graceful stru uh, structures, everything that flows, she's just lovely. This one is beautiful in form because it suits her function. But in many ways, this is the stripped-down, bare-bones construction version. This is the one which is built to a tight budget, trying to get in as much capability in the hull allowed by their, their law and their finances, with mild levels of blackmail, threat, and persuasion going on to the various yards involved. And then this is the product of competitive tendering and a cutthroat industry where yards are going bankrupt if they don't get the right or get the orders and be fulfilled to the satisfaction of the navy this is despite yards also competing for huge amounts of merchant orders as well the sheer overheads and the sheer volume of production you need going through a yard which is large enough to build and manufacture a battleship or equivalent in its under one roof is colossal. You need to maintain a lot of throughput going through to justify all the very expensive machinery and very qualified and skilled tradespeople you need in service. You need under contract. Because again, we had this idea of these labourers getting paid paltry wages and being treated terribly by people who are, you know, rubbing their hands together going, I'm making lots of money. And that's not really the case in this period. Oh yes, there are mm, 
unskilled labourers, apprentice labourers, who are more than likely treated like excrement. But once you're trained, once you pass your apprenticeship, and you're skilled, you're valuable. Because if your work doesn't pass inspection when the naval constructors come round, and with their sh team of shipwrights and chiefs, and check the ship over, then I won't get paid. And there are lots of ways you can damage me without ever going on strike. One contract gets mucked up, and that's my entire revenue stream gone. Because the Navy doesn't forget, and they have options. And the Navy, unlike the Army, or rather the Navy in Britain, unlike the German Navy, the Kaiserlich Marine, is the power politically. Yes, we are often used to looking back on an almost post-World War I army, where the army grows to such a huge size fighting on the Western Front in World War I, that it becomes a far more dominant political force than it has ever been in British politics prior to this. Even when people like Wellington have been Prime Minister, the British Army didn't have the dominance in politics that achieved post-World War I, after the mass conscription and mass service. The dominant military influence in political circles, especially in foreign policy and foreign affairs, had always been the Navy. And they were the dominant when it came to economic affairs as well, in the scenario, because they could present a very sound economic case for investing in the Navy. You invest in the Navy, you upgrade and improve, you are employing people in shipyards. Those people who are employed pay taxes. Those shipyards develop and compete and get foreign contracts and merchant contracts, which allow them to pay even more taxes. And therefore, it creates a virtuous circle of money coming into the Treasury. It all makes perfect logical sense. Now, here is when we get into the area where I am probably going to get some people upset with me. So, I went through all the yards used to construct capital ships, i.e. battleships, battle cruisers, and even some pre-dreadnoughts, in the relevant years from Jutland. You'll notice the Royal Navy has 11 to call on. And the German Navy has, I'm going to check this, I've written it up there, but I'm still checking it. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Ten yards versus eleven yards. I know, this is a stat which has always worried me. When I've looked up, gone, they've got ten yards which are competing for orders versus eleven. And let's be honest, there is one on here called Thames Ironworks of London which goes bankrupt. So realistically, for some later years in the run-up to World War One, you have 10 v 10. So you theoretically have the same number of yards. But then you look at the size of those yards. You look at their rate of production of those yards. And that's where that figure at the top, which is not really that helpful other than giving you a rough rule of thumb. The 37 ships, which the Royal Navy has, at the Battle of Jutland, so I'm just considering ships in the fleet, were built by 11 yards over 10 years for an average of 3.7 ships per year. And I'll get into the average per yard in a bit. So 27 ships built by 10 yards over 13 years, so an average of 2.7 ships. Hmm... Sorry, I had one of those moments where I looked at the figure and went, I know that's wrong figure, I know that is the wrong figure, and then looked at my Excel spreadsheet, which is there, and my PowerPoint slides, which are there, which I'm checking the details off against, and they've both had 2.077, and that, for some reason, had 2.7. No idea why. 
27 ships built by 10 yards over 13 years for an average of 2.077 ships per year. Uh, per year. Or if pre drowned knots are left out, and 21 ships built by 10 yards over 8 years for an average of 2.625 ships per year. So, the British are averaging 3.7 ships a year in terms of production and launched. The Germans are averaging 2.625 or 2.077, depending on who you want to sort of look at specifically. If you're just looking at the, the dreadnoughts, it's 2.625, and that's probably the fair one to look at. Which means, from the get-go, the British are usually launching a ship a year extra. On average. Which means, if we start to do it to this stat, which is really bad, pointless stats that tell us nothing, because some yards produce a lot of ships, and some only one before going bankrupt. I have literally made that the title, so before you start critiquing, if anyone wants to, in the comments below and go... But, you know, this stat's pointless because of X. Yes. yes, this is a rule of thumb average guide. To try and give you a rough idea of the efficiency of the yards as an overall structure. It's... I sort of say, when we're working through stats like this, if historians are working with stats like this, it's usually done in the very early drafting stages of us doing a work. We put together some very basic calculations. And the whole point of these, of these calculations is so we can have a rule of thumb to work out whether a yard is more efficient than we were expecting it to be, or less efficient. Because often the only thing we can do with yards is compare them to each other in the aggregate to work out their efficiency for a contemporary period. And the less you can go back in time and monitor the yards and do a live time and motion study of the yard in progress... From a bird's eye position with a drone watching everyone, you cannot do it any other way. So you have a rule of thumb, and then you look at the actual production of the ship's yard, and you go, well, this is an efficient one. And you go, that one, that one's not an efficient one. What are the problems? What's causing that one to be less efficient? Or is it supply of materials? And there is something which is a supply problem for the German Navy when it comes to construction of ships. There is a problem. British average production per yard. If we adjust for the seven British and missing a British. Excuse me a second. Much better. British style vessels. But still more than missing pre dreadnoughts, you know, Ramleys, Renown, Repulse, Glorious, Courageous, Furious, and. Renown or a pulse I'm sort of in two minds worth to ignore or not. But seeing as I'm also ignoring in this stat, I'm also carefully ignoring Ramelies, as I mentioned. I cannot include Renown or a pulse in this in good conscience. So if I'm uh, removing all of them, well, adding them in, you've basically got another ten. You've got ten ships, and I'm I'm increasing up to forty uh, that up to forty seven. Well, you have. Over 11 yards, you have it as 0 0.3364. If it's 44, over 12 years, around, it's 0 0.3333 returning production value. So the average is every year a ship, a shipyard, one of those shipyards will produce a third, pretty much, of a capital ship. Okay. So the average German production yards. 2.077 over 10 is 0 0.02077. Or if we're not going to include the lovely, lovely vessels known as, <clears throat> known as pre dreadnoughts, it goes to 0 0.2625. If we adjust for the two missing dreadnoughts it goes up to 0.2875 here this is the figure 
which I would normally start to look at. So if I'm looking at German production per yard and British production per yard in terms of launch ship, they have an extra yard and they are averaging a third of a ship a year. They are averaging, averaging unfortunately, not a third of a ship a year, just below it, from less yards. Okay, but still, I would like to argue that that figure shows the quality of the German yards and that shows the quality of the British yards, and it shows they are not that different. Okay, so you can argue, oh, the German ships were more complicated, they had, you know, more armor, more, you know, tend, uh, tend to have more of a honeycombing sort of structure in terms of more subdivision, all these things. You can argue is that that's the reason for them being late. That is going to be a part of it, but it's not going to be that level of difference because they're also honeycombed, they're also subdivided. So what is making this difference in production yards? What is the making difference in terms of ships which are coming? Because again, when we start looking at the ships, if we were doing the aggregate tonnages, the British ones usually, well, are not that dissimilar from their counterparts. Again, if we go with the coinings, they are 25,000... 796 tons, so basically roughly 26,000 tons in normal. The King George V's are 25,830 tons in normal. So again, well actually they're technically 34 tons heavier, roughly 26,000 tons. The Iron Dukes, mm, again, 25,000 tons theoretical displacement. It's usually actually slightly different than that, let's be honest. Uh, 25,400 tons for Iron Duke herself was the official figure, but she was, um, fairly chonky. And then we have 33,000 ton uh, tons for the Queen Elizabeth class, compared to the Bayans, who... And that's her disp their displacement in normal. In deep load, they're about 33,790 tons in deep load. So 33,100 tons in normal, 33,790 tons in deep, and the Bayon, 28,530 tons in normal, 32,200 tons in full. So their displacements are not of such a large differential that you can really say one is much more complicated or much more subdivided than the other, or it's going to be much easier to produce in terms of volume of work. They're going to be slightly different styles, but they're not going to be overwhelmingly different in terms of level of difficulty. So, perhaps that's not it. What, then, is this differential? Is it the supply of materials? Well, considering the amount of industry Germany is attached to, that would be difficult to argue. So, where is an option? Well, it starts down to not so much the quality of the yards, or even the wider German industrial capacity in terms of steel production, or their ability to build ships, it starts to come back to their breadth and depth of maritime industry and the level of consistent funding they're able to put into it. Okay? One of the things you have to understand is turbines are incredibly expensive. And it takes a long time for civilian companies to get interested in them enough to justify companies investing in them. Okay? The thing is, this allows 
Britain to get almost an unfair advantage in this. When we start looking at American battleships, when we start looking at Italian battleships, when we look at French battleships, when we look at pretty much any battleship of anyone else going on in the world, there is a name which keeps cropping up as providing the turbines for them. Parsons. Now, sometimes they provide them under license. But if you're dealing with turbines that you want for a battle cruiser, if you want them for a battle cruiser, they have to be built to the highest level of tolerances of a turbine imaginable at the time. Believe it or not, there are two makers of such turbines in the world. Britain has both. John Brown and Parsons. Now, slowly, the Germans get there. And it's mostly thanks to the works of Hermann Fottinger. It is nothing to do with a lack of brain power on the German capabilities. It is to do with a lack of financial power for the German Navy. And the fact that German industry isn't going to invest in this just for a vanity project to have a solar facility set up to build turbines for Kaiser Wilhelm to go, well, I've got a faster ship. They're just not going to. Prior classes to the Kaiser class are all triple expansion engines. We start to look at why do the engine ships start to slow down? Well, it's because they they almost go through for almost every single ship a similar process. They first try and find a German alternative. They try to build for it. Then they realize it's not going to work. They order the Parsons and they adapt the hull. This slows them down. Combined with building to always a tight budget, combined with never having enough money. Mm -hmm. But here is one of the interesting things. Of the Bayon class, the two which get which get completed are the Bayon and the Baden, who get three sets of Parsons turbines. These are supplied by Levin Forn Coal Fired Schill's Fornicroft style boilers. And three Olfard Schulz Fornicroft boilers. They're Schulz manufactured Fornicroft designs. If you're going, hang on, Alex, that does I, that that company doesn't sound German. It's not. It's another British yard. It's another British manufacturer. The Schikau, uh, Schikau, uh, Turbines are mucking it up. Are very very good, but they have issues. The AG Curtis turbines. I wonder where they came from. Oh yeah, thank you, Curtis, America. So, when we get to the Kaiser class, Kaiserin and Kaiser uh, Kaiserin get three Parsons. British Leopold got two Parsons, and it was planned the diesel would replace the third. They were trying to push the diesel. Frederick Lodegross got three sets of AG Curtis turbines, and Koenig Albert gets three sets of German produced turbines. But notice then the Koenig class. The Koenig Crowns Prince get Parsons. The Grosser Kurfürst got Vulcan AG turbines, and the Makgraf got Bergmann. So they're going. Well, hang on, Alex. There's suddenly a lot of companies involved in the, in the uh, production of turbines. Yes, because the German Navy is trying to build up a turbine industry. Because they know they can't afford to rely on Parsons. Because if they don't do, then they're going to have no spare parts if there's ever a war with the British. And they don't want there to be a war with the British. Trust me, the German Navy engineering team do not want there to be a war with the British. Because they know just how many spare parts come from Britain's wider maritime industry. And this is when you realise the really unseen part of the British maritime industrial complex. When you start to look at the wider Renault race and the real roots of the technology which supply it, you realise this, that whilst a lot of the ideas about companies starting arms races etc in order to make a profit are 
Sadly, not true, because that would provide us with an easy cause of such things. There is a certain scenario that companies can make profit from both sides. And they do. Parsons shamelessly does. But they also tend to shamelessly sell their slightly less capable turbine designs abroad. Then they manage to manufacture a new generation to sell to the British, and they start selling off their foreign versions of their previous generation to abroad. John Brown, Curtis, a few other companies all do something rather similar. Without them, Think about the German Navy if they don't have access to Parsons turbines. In those periods, Curtis are lovely, but they produce tur the biggest ship turbines they produce are for are designed for American battleships. They do not produce battle cruiser turbines. There is a difference in the level of construction and in the the style of operation you need for a battle cruiser turbine than you do for a battleship turbine. The speed alone requires differences. The operating efficiencies require differences. One of the reasons why the US Navy actually discusses at points about the Lexington class for why they take so long to produce battle cruisers is producing their own necessary power plants domestically. If you look at Japan, again, it's British designs. Some of them are even built in Britain. And a lot of these turbines, these Parsons turbines, are built in Britain. Some are built under license. That is how some of these companies get their start building turbines, by paying exorbitant amounts to Parsons to help them set up as a turbine manufacturer. But here's the question. Do you think to, do you think Parsons trains them to be competitors to them? Do you really think Parsons will train someone to be a competitor to them? Or Curtis will? Yes, the Germans have industry. They have very good industry. They have very smart people. Hermann Fossinger is probably one of the smartest, after Parsons himself, in terms of understanding and developing turbines. And the only reason I give it to Parsons ahead of Fossinger is because of the, some of the work he does in terms of how he refines the British, uh, British turbine design. But seriously... There is not much difference between the two in terms of their quality. But again, the reality is, as much as German industry is trumpeted and as much as they shout, as much as anyone shouts about any industrial accomplishment, when you're building something as complicated as a dreadnought battleship or as any modern warship, the odds are there are going to be significant components which are not going to come from your own country. You're either going to build them under license, or you're going to have to buy them from abroad. And by the way, this is the same debate we have going on to this day. One of the interesting things I have in contemporary affairs I'm currently watching is, of course, the Australian frigate competition and the Type 26 involvement in it. And one of the things that keeps being... F conveniently forgotten by people when they're doing the cost analysis. They do a cost analysis of the Australian figures for the Type 26 program and they compare it to the American costs of producing the Constellation class. And they forget three things. One, the Australian government hasn't been building ships in Australia. They've been having the Hobarts were built in Spain and then they are fitted out in Australia and the same with the Canberras. They haven't been building ships in Australia. So you've got to rebuild that industry. And if you want to have a chance of building nuclear submarines, you've got to rebuild a surface ship building capability as a, start, as a starting point. So there's that cost. 
Next cost is if you're building it on a, if building Australia, you're then establishing all the support structures in Australia. So there's that cost added on to the cost, and then you're finally buying the ship. And you're paying a premium all the way through to build it in Australia. If you want to really chair to, uh, compare the Type 26 and the, and the Constellation class, ask how much it would cost for the Australians to build the Type 26 in the UK. With the British Yards, which are building the Type 26, and not at full pace production. Ask how much, and that would be a comparison cost with the Constellation class. And it's the same for the Germans, because here is a problem we have going on. One of the reasons why the British are able to outbuild the Germans, as they are, it's not just industry, it's not just the budget for the Navy. It's volume going through that industry. It's the fact that the British, buying roughly the same ship, are going to spend less every single time. And they're going to buy more of them. And that money is going to go into the British economy, especially in this period. Whereas some of the money from the German development programs and development systems is going to go into the British economy. And Parsons turbines are a good example of this. But it's not the only thing I can focus on. It's not the only mechanism I can talk about. And yes, you can turn around and go, well, Alex, what about shell detonators? And you'd be right. The British had terrible detonators for their shells. They did. Because they'd always relied on getting German ones. So that is where you can point to British inefficiencies. And that's what leads to some of the British problems at Jutland. And the fact that the losses seem to, well, especially the high-profile losses, stack up so much on one side. So one side has built in, because of its capabilities, has managed to build in shell inefficient, uh, fire weaponry inefficiencies into the other side. But the other side has been able to build in utility and usability differences. And then we have armoured cruisers. Only the Royal Navy takes those to the fight. Why? Why do the German, does the German Navy bring pre-dreadnoughts? The Royal Navy is looking at an issue, and we'll be getting to that in a bit. But that issue coming up is the sheer quantity of smaller vessels and torpedoes. And the Royal Navy's desire to make sure those torpedo launching vessels get nowhere near their capital ships. A figure which we'll be discussing later. On Royal Navy destroyers, there are 236 torpedoes. 21 inch torpedoes carried. The Germans, on their destroyers, carry 299. That is 63 more torpedoes, which might not seem a lot to you. But when you consider overall the cumulative force strength in torpedoes is 457 on the British to 469 on the German, with the stronger side being the German, you start to understand where some of the British focus on enemy destroyer force, uh, enemy torpedo forces, and enemy torpedoes comes from, and some of Jellicoe's thinking comes from. Because Holes on the deck don't sink a ship. Holes that let water in sink a ship. 
they do. Then we get to light cruisers. And so far, there are no armored cruisers. Blücher was sunk earlier in the war, and the Germans really didn't have many suitable vessels before then. And then we get to light cruisers. And we start to see another problem for the German Navy. Their yards have been building dreadnoughts. They've done good, well, they've almost been as efficient in construction of dreadnoughts as the British have, but let's be honest, the British have also been building cruisers. Lots of cruisers. Lots and lots of cruisers. And the German Navy has nothing on this. They really don't. The Royal Navy brings them to the Battle of Jutland 26 light cruisers to the 11 that the German, the Kaiserlich Marine, has with it. Let's state that again. 26 to 11. That's not 2 to 1. That's very nearly 2 and a half to 1 in terms of numbers. It's very nearly that. Very, very nearly. Why? Because they're an important part of fleet formations? Yes. But why does the Royal Navy have so many compared to the German Navy? Well, then you start thinking about, hang on, how many others does the Royal Navy have around the world at this point? Doing trade protection duties, doing convoy escorts, doing all sorts of things around the world in case of surface raiders, uh, supporting operations in the Far East, in refit and repair in the Mediterranean. You start to realise the Royal Navy has a lot of them. A lot of them. A lot of light cruisers wandering around. And they have been building these while they've also been building dreadnoughts. The German Navy really doesn't have them. Really doesn't have the numbers to match in. There was a discussion on my Discord channel. On the server, which you go down below and find a link to. And it's a good community, it's an interesting community. Which was talking about the American Navy post-World War One, And the discussion is basically... Well, they were a battleship and destroyer navy. They had a very limited cruiser force. They're not the only navy which has a very limited cruiser force for its size. Proportionally, cruiser force, the, the German navy just isn't there at this battle. And again, they've chosen what to bring to this battle. They're the ones who have st chosen a date for coming out. So yes, they don't have many cruisers to call upon, but they've chosen to go with only 11 light cruisers. It's like Jellicoe chose to leave Royal Sovereign behind. She wasn't up to it. Her crew wasn't trained enough yet. And then we look at the light cruisers they've chosen, and, well, the British ones, the oldest star from that were launched in 1908. The Germans bring with them a light cruiser that was launched in 1902. Now, capital ships, they have a shelf life, a value. Even the pre-dreadnoughts, you can say, in the nicest way, the Royal Navy outnumbers us so much that having those extra guns, and we'll talk about those gun numbers, is a necessity. It is a criteria for our survivability and to make this a viable operation. True. But you're taking a gazelle class. 
into this battle. Brenham class. The Königsbergs... I'd like to be mad about, but they're good little cruisers. They're good little cruisers. But still... Why? Because you don't have any other options. That's the reason for it. And because you've been selling everything on building a Dreadnought fleet. Everything is based on you having the Dreadnoughts. And a key enabler for those Dreadnoughts haven't been built. We, we talk about World War II with the German Navy and their destroyer problem. Well, also they still have a light cruiser problem in World War II. They have a light cruiser problem. Their scout cruiser which were really going to be their oceanic destroyer program, never gets built. So their ships don't have escorts. Now we can say, well, you know, the conservatism of some of the British commanders, the lack of information flow, means that, frankly, look at how well the German Navy does the job. They do really well. But also you start thinking about, well, hang on, what would happen if they managed to invest a little bit more in their light cruisers? Ooh, they could have done really well. But amongst their light cruisers, they're carrying 26 torpedoes. The British light cruisers are carrying 66 torpedoes. And a lot of guns. And that's the British counter to the German destroyers. It's the light cruisers, it's the armoured cruisers, it's the rapid firing guns on their battleships and battle cruisers. Those are their counters to the Germans' strength in destroyer torpedo not boat numbers. And they have a lot of ships here to do it with. And they're not old ships either. They're the Arafusers, the Seas, and the Town class. These are very good classes. Again, the, you, you then go down and you find the Bodicea, Blonde, and Active class. What are they involved with? They're destroyer leaders. Okay. So that's where they are. And then we start to look at the actual destroyers. And again, the Royal Navy has got 79 with them. And again, these are modern, capable craft. The oldest are 1912. And think about that. The sheer amount of construction. We've got their cruisers, uh, their light cruisers date back to 1908. The armoured cruisers, well, they date back earlier. They're, some of them go back to 1903. But, you know, the German cruisers date back to 1902. So that's sort of evened out. And then we've got the capital ships. 1907 battle cruisers. 1907 battleships. 1903 with the pre dreadnoughts. So they're all within about 11 years in terms of the capital ship ones. And in terms of the cruisers as well, they're all within roughly 13 or sort of 11 to 13 years. But destroyers. Well, there are 14 Acasta, Acasta destroyers from 1912 in the 4th Destroyer Flotilla, and there are 3 Acastas in, in, attached to 3rd Battle Squadron, uh, HMS Christopher, HMS Shark, and HMS Acasta herself. They're 1912 vessels, and other than that, the rest are 1913. There are 9... Akron, 1911 class destroyers attached to 5th Battle Squadron, 1st Destroyer Flotilla. Nine of these vessels. Does anyone imagine that 5th Battle Squadron got bad torpedo boat destroyers?
In fact, <coughs> HMS Oak, an Akron class destroyer, was used as a tender for the flagship. That was, in other words, the Akron class were the class of destroyers which Jellico liked the most because he picked one as his own tender. He's painted white and wandering around. And by the way, many of these cruisers were also being used by the Royal Navy to repeat signals up and down the line. Rather like frigates in the age of running in battle. That is another key and advantage of this sheer quantity of vessels. They can provide information relay as well as covering for destroyers and enemy attacks. And with their torpedoes even hold off perhaps capital ships if they come from the wrong direction. And lead and cover these. And although they also have their own flotilla leaders with them. The larger destroyers. And this group of destroyers again. Are the 79 destroyers the Royal Navy happened to have available at this point to attach to the Grand Fleet. Happened to. For Jutland. It also has vessels off with the Harwich Force. It has vessels off manning the Channel Boom. It has vessels patrolling in the North Sea. It has vessels off in the Mediterranean. It has vessels off doing escort duty around for convoys and running down U-boats all around the United Kingdom at this point. They don't have a full convoy program going at this point. They don't in World War One. But they do have some convoying going on of coal and various other convoy uh, f supplies coming up to Scarpa Flow. And so they have destroyers attached to them. You start to realise at this point just how many destroyers the Royal Navy had at its disposal in World War One. Then we go to the German destroyers. The Kaiserlich Ramin uh, Marine Torpedo Butter. Again. There is some fun here because they have the Grob torpedo boat, which basically means large torpedo boat and sort of equals destroyer. And uh, it's sort of equivalent to a destroyer in some of their types. And then you have the Hosh, Hosh Sea torpedo boat, or the Ocean Going torpedo boat, or High Sea torpedo boat, uh, which is definitely a destroyer most of the time. And broadly speaking, there is the G101s. The V1s and the V25s, which provide a pre-war pool of 99 vessels. 61 of these were at Jutland. They are not big ships. They are not the ships of World War II. They are certainly not the ships of today. That we know as destroyers. But they're the ships they were using. And again, they are pretty darn young. So the Royal Navy has been building all of these. And all their sisters which are in service elsewhere. And all the light cruisers. And dreadnoughts. And still building more, thanks to their industry, maritime industrial base. And not breaking the British Bank at all. And yet, the Germans haven't managed to build the light cruisers. They haven't managed to build any sort of armoured cruisers, contemporaries, industry really, in terms of the same numbers. They've had a few. They did have some good armoured cruisers. Please note, again, they had good armoured cruisers. People sometimes take this to me going, oh, they didn't have good... No. They didn't have enough to also cover the deployments to the China Station, etc. and various other places they hadn't deployed. And still keep enough available for what they needed to do with the ground fleet. And so they got lost. They got lost at the Battle of Falklands. And again, you go, well, they won the Battle of Cape Coronel. They did. They won the Battle of Cape Coronel. But it's like a lot of problems for the Germans. Did they win enough to justify what they lost? 
what they lost to the Falklands, did that overwhelm what they managed to win at the Battle of Coronel? Because the Germans need to win and not lose. And they need to win a lot. To quote a politician who said this recently, they need to win bigly. When I say recently, you know, within living memory. They need to win mahusively, in the phrases that I use on this channel. They don't. The British can win a naval war of attrition, thanks to construction. The British don't want to fight a naval war of attrition. No one wants to fight a naval war of attrition, because frankly, that's going to cost a lot of people dead. And those are people you have to train. You have to replace. And to regrow a human, is, in the nicest way, is not just the case of, baby, 18 years, we can use them. No. Think about how long it takes to regrow a captain. That's 40-odd years. And frankly, you're going to need a large pool to draw from to hope to get that one. So it's not going to be not going to be one person for all the ideas. You're talking about a few hundred people. It's expensive. It's not something you want to do. It's actually easier to replace the ships at this time than it is the people by a long margin. So why did the Germans bring their pre dreadnoughts with them? Well, when you start to look at the gun numbers, it starts to make sense. Um, basically, the Germans are in a scenario where they have 260 British battleship guns to face with 156 of their own. They have 72 battlecruiser guns to face with 44 of their own. Admittedly, this is not necessarily reflected in the broadsides, but it tends to be reflected in the broadsides because, again, Germans tend to have more of a trouble broadsides than British do in terms of numeracy because the Germans tend to have gone for that six-sided star approach and could have as many as two turrets out of their ships, not able to fire on the one side. So, a ship which has 12 guns could have a broadside of eight guns, whereas a British ship of 10 guns would often have a broadside of eight guns. not necessarily the greatest scenario. So, they brought the pre-dreadnoughts with them to give them 24 extra guns. And they are still 224 guns versus 332 guns. It gets even worse once you start looking at the numbers of guns in specific color areas. They have 48, the British have 48 15 inch guns, the Germans have zero. The British have 10 14 inch guns. The Germans have zero at Jutland. The British have 142 13 and a half inch guns, the Germans have zero. The British have 132 12 inch guns, the Germans have 128. Now, you can argue that the German 11-inch gun, of not, which they have 96 of, is equivalent to the British 12-inch gun in its capabilities. That's a the argument you can make. I don't agree with it, but you can make it. And you can argue, if you want, that the German 12-inch gun is equivalent to the British 13.5-inch gun. The trouble is, there's still 132 to 96 and 142 to 28. And... Um, 10, 14 inch and 48, 15 inch, which are unanswered. Now, we all know the Battle of Toshima where people were just adding up numbers of guns got it wrong, but when you have an advantage of 110 guns over your opponent and you are not 
running at the end of your logistics train without having to be able to rearm your ships or repair your ships after a global oceanic voyage. And the French ports, which you thought you would get access to, you get turned away from, so instead you are com trying to fix yourself a sea before making a last mad dash for Russian territory because that is your only hope for getting your fleet constituted as somewhere safely so they can form it to actually offer a viable battle, you are not in that scenario where these guns do not really matter. The number of guns starts to not mattering. No, in this scenario, you have two fully formed up. Well, as much as we can claim the German fleet is fully formed up, considering its weaker shortages in terms of cruisers. Two fully formed up forces going to fight each other. And this is just primary guns. This is not even getting into the calibers which will be on the cruisers and in the secondary mounts of these ships. This is just their primaries. That is a large advantage the Germans were having to overcome. It's cumulative. If you think of it in terms of ship numbers and ship hulls, it's rather easier than when you think of it in terms of sheer firepower. Sheer monumental firepower. There is enough firepower taking, uh, taking the sides in this battle that many of the land battles in Model 1 with their mass artillery exchanges would have been jealous. The sheer weight and volume and accuracy of fire. Then we have torpedo tubes. If we look at it, you sort of go, hang on. The Germans actually have more torpedo tubes on their capital ships than the British do. The British have a lot more capital ships, but the Germans have a lot more torpedoes on those ships. They have 144 torpedoes on their sh capital ships. The British have a mere 126. Okay, the British actually have cruisers which have torpedo tubes, but leave that to one side. Then light cruisers. That's the only area where the British have an advantage in torpedo tubes over their counterparts. And for those wondering where the stats come from, that's must the Jutland book which was here. There it is. It was there. They all come from in here. Edited by William Schneifler, Jutland, the Naval Staff's Appreciation. And it seemed to be a sensible place to start off and check for information, and I did a few others as well. I got all my Jutland books piled up there at the moment. And it really interested me. The decisive advanced capability that the Germans had, their superiority in numbers, that they the only one they really have in this battle, is 12 torpedo tubes. Decisive? No, not really. Not enough to really be decisively different. But it's enough to make you think that, hang on, maybe Jellico was worried about torpedoes for a reason. Looking at the number of German vessels versus the number of vessels he has, and the number of torpedo tubes they have versus the number of torpedo tubes he has, well, this is what 99 ships have, this is what 151 ships have. So this is an average of, what, three torpedo tubes per ship? And this is an average of, what, four and two-thirds? 4.6 per ship? You start to think, hang on. 
I can see where uh, someone who has studied the mathematics of war, gunnery and torpedoes as much as Jellico has, is going to think and presume the Germans are going to do torpedo tactics. And this is part of their construction here. This is about them getting the most out of their capabilities. The British are going for guns. Why? Because for the power, the, the range of prospective problems the Royal Navy's got to deal with, guns make the most sense. So you put the effort into guns. But if you're going for a fleet which is existing to act as a counterbalance to a far larger force, torpedoes. Where if you get that one lucky hit, you can take out an entire battleship with one hit, one hole in the wrong place, letting in one large amount of water, you know, it suddenly starts to make a lot of sense. So really, what is the most interesting thing to me about the Battle of Jutland? Well, we're actually going through the battle, and I have gone through the battle. It's uh, Admiral Beatty, and the fact that his inability to do his job. Considering his previous performance in various other years of service, uh, but it is a collective failure of his entire staff, and that has to, the, the fault for that has to rest with him. However, the other really interesting thing for me with this was the sheer amount of force left off the table. The Germans do have more, some more cruisers and some more vessels they could have theoretically called upon, but they didn't. They're the ones who are making a dash out. They're the ones who could organise things. They didn't. Waiting for the Koenig Albert to be ready... Deciding to take the pre dreadnoughts with them. All these things are destruction, are construction, the choices they made and design and four and four structured decisions they made in the light of the scenario they found themselves. But the thing is, they're not the only ones who leave ships behind. Imagine turning around to your newest 15 inch gunship. Theoretically, one of the most powerful warships in service anywhere in the world. No, 15-inch gun ships you can number on two hands in service in the world at this point. And going, no. You're not coming. I don't think you're ready for it yet. You're going off to fight what is possibly going to be the biggest... Largest battle ever fought at sea. It is one of the biggest large battles. You're going off to fight the battle which you are going to be known for through history. And you say no to taking a 15-inch gunship with you. There are ships on that list which I can understand being left off. But... I can also understand why the Royal Sovereign was taken, but I just think the sheer confidence, the sheer ego on Jellico to be able to turn around and go, no. No. I don't need you. Would it have made any difference having an extra 15-inch gunship there? You have no... We have no idea. Would it? Probably not. Where would have she been? She'd have been with the other R's sitting back with Jellicoe's squadron. So, not in 5th Battle Squadron running south and all, all that sort of thing. Thing like that. But she would have been there. The more and more you start going through these lists of these ships, and you see the sheer amount of light cruisers that the British could have brought with them, Again, he could have issued an all all ports call for every light cruiser up and down the coast of Britain, and every destroyer to form up and head to him. He didn't. What would that have got him? Possibly an extra dozen or so light cruisers. Mm, mostly town class. 
and probably about the same number extra, maybe a few more destroyers. But they hadn't practiced as part of the Grand Fleet, but they're again, they're part of the Royal Navy, and he could probably have made use of them somehow. HMS Achilles was in refit from the warrior class. Natal had been sunk in 1915. The Royal Navy armored cruisers are there. HMS Defense, which could have made such a difference to the Battle of Coral, uh, Battle of um, Coronel. Just about to say Coral Sea. All there. Devonshire class. There are five more members of that class who are patrolling around refit. Australia was in refit. I, you know, nicest way. New Zealand. Did you had to take out Australia? Is this how? You, is this how you stopped another ship being lost? Is this was that New Zealand's cunning plan? We're going to stop another ship being lost from the battle cruiser force by taking her out before she can get into battle. Protect our sister. But we go down and, you know, Dreadnought, yeah. Do you, what, does she re what help does she really give the fleet? She's there. You can argue all against that, but Emperor India, she would have been nice to have. And Duke of Iron Duke class would have been extra Iron Duke, lovely. The others are in refit, and the British don't make decision of when the battle takes place. But Royal Sovereign. Royal Sovereign's there. She's been training with the ground fleet. She's just judged as inexperienced. And the amount of force left out of the battle on both sides, but especially by the British. It's in many ways staggering. Because that amount of force would have been considered its own very capable fleet by some standards around the world. They have good ships. They are good ships on both sides. But ultimately, the most interesting thing about this battle is the amount of force left off it, despite its being constructed and being available. And I hope you enjoyed this one. What have we got coming up? Uh, we have Patron 79 tomorrow? No, that's happened. That was yesterday. I'm recording this on Friday, it was Thursday. Uh, this is coming out on Saturday instead of the Patreon 79 video, because you voted to um, this in, was being the Saturday video instead of the Long Patrol from Patreon 79, which will come out at some point. And Brew Ships 113, and then next week we have Gunther Lunchens, Useful Idiot or Misunderstood Leadership, and then we have Key Ships, uh, Glorious 1st of June, uh, on, the 17th, uh, on the 1st of June. And, well, then I'm in Australia. And... We have a rough plan, because it's now theoretically too late for Gareth to join us. But if we have enough money, he's going to join us in this bit. And he's going to actually arrive in Sydney before us and be our advanced person in Sydney. And then he's going to come with me to um, Canberra. And this is roughly it. And I've put in, I penciled in dates, as you can see, for the 6th, the 10th, the 13th, the 18th, and the 23rd. Um, for dinners with you, basically, with viewers, subscribers, anyone who wants to have a dinner with us. Um, we, we're looking for venues that you think are suitable, and we would like people to volunteer to me or to Drac. If you get in contact with me or Drac, please pass it around on Discord servers. Um, if they, see if there's anyone in Australia, in those cities, who would like to volunteer to be the local coordinator. If we can have someone who's coordinating the local area, has the local phone number, can therefore deal with the people, and we'll, we'll set up a restaurant, or set up a suitable place, 
I use the phrase restaurant, I mean that very loosely. Um, me and myself and Drakenafel are carnivores. Uh, Dan is a medical doctor, so he does believe actually in eating vegetables. Look, he's a healer. We, he, he's useful for those skills. We, we, we might worry about, uh, worry about him from his consumption of vegetables, but he's useful for those skills. And this is where we're going. We're going to the Western Australian Museum. We're going in Perth. We're going to be there on the 7th and 8th. Um, we're going to be 10th at HMAS Castlemaine. They are lovely people. We're also hoping to visit the HMAS Yarra Memorial. We want to be, uh, go on Polly Woodside. She's owned by the National Trust in Australia, and she she is was lovely. We there are conversations ongoing with some of these museums to still sort out the exact details of what we're going to be doing with them. I'm still. It's always found, it sounds like people go, "Why are you still organising stuff at this late date?" Because we like to get permissions, but we don't like to form up too much or them to start advertising stuff until we have the funding in place and we know we can go. Because otherwise, they put a lot of work and a lot of effort into it, and then it, if it falls through, we feel we've wasted their time and wasted their money, and they haven't got enough money to waste. So that's why some of these things are basically being ordered in organised in the last week. They're literally being put together this week and next week and before we go. And there's a reason I arrive in, in Perth when I do. So I can get start getting ahead and I'm going to be... Uh, basically, I'm being our advanced person for Perth and sorting all through that. Then we do Melbourne, Brisbane. And Gareth arrives in Sydney, hopefully if we've raised the money for him. He... Does the advance duties for Sydney and sorts out all of that. Uh, we go to the Royal Fleet Air Arm Museum. We then go to the uh, to the Australian and National Maritime Museum, and then me and Gareth go to Canberra, and it's the Australian War Memorial, and it's going to be lovely, but it's all dependent on sort of your help. And if you want, I will put this up somewhere on the channel. I will put this up. In Discord, etc., for you to find out the details of where we are, when we're going to be, and where we're, where we're roughly when we're going to be places. I know both myself and Drakenafel are going to be tweeting stuff out and put in Discord where we are, when we are. I'm going to also be updating stuff on YouTube, and as we go, and hopefully that's all good, and you'll know where we are, when we are, and what we're doing. And if you want to come see us, you're more than welcome. We will love you. We will love saying hello to you all and chatting with you all. And what have we got coming up? While I'm away, you're going to have a lot of videos coming out. I have still got to record Building the Fleets of Midway and Fleet of Imperium Warhammer 40k. Cheaper Way of War, the Juno Cole, is going to be re-recorded. And Dreadnought Battleships leading up to World War One. Eh, honestly, I do admit that one's a little bit of a cheat. <coughs> but it's a cheat I can justify. <laughs> because, yes, I've done a video series which is very similar to it, but I, I'm doing this as one video rather than a whole series of little videos, so it's kind of condensed. That's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. Okay? Please, there's... There's only two weeks to go, and I've got, like... eight videos to be happy with. <laughs> On top of the ones I'm normally doing. It's going to be fun. It's all going to work out. It will all get done. I've got a timetable. I've got a plan. It will work. It will work. Thank you very much, everyone. And, right, we're, I'm not going to finish the chat a question, but there's been a couple of topics which will probably come up with discuss, uh, discursive points for you in discussing, in discussing for this sort of, this video, but the question which I was going to finish this off with is, well, there's two-parter. One, do you think those extra light cruisers and Royal Sovereign would have made a big difference to the battle if the Royal Navy had been able to call it, uh, had taken them with them, called them in? And... The other question... And this is something worthwhile thinking about because, again, 
it's an option. What do you think happens if the German Navy, instead of going with turbines and going with battle cruisers, concentrates on keep building triple expansion engines and battleships? Dreadnought battleships with triple expansion engines rather than turbines. Does everything else, you know, build up the guns? Do you think if they do that, they manage to keep up a higher rate of production and perhaps even achieve a closer level of equality with the Royal Navy? Whilst probably not having battle cruisers, which the Royal Navy would still want for defending their empire, uh, the, defending their empire interests around the world, but you know, do the German Navy really need them? So, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and take care. Doodles.